Okay, so uh, we've introduced ourselves to the uh, rate equations, uh, and what we're going to do over the next couple of days is uh, expand how to use those rate equations in more complex uh, situations that we can still define as one-dimensional. And the way we're going to start that is to think about heat transfer as a flow. Um, there are some really important fundamental laws in physics that take the form of a flow equation. And, and that form fits this format right here, where whatever it is that's flowing is going to be equal to what's forcing that movement uh, divided by what's resisting that movement. So a driving force uh, divided by a resistance. Uh, and let's look at a couple of those fundamental equations just so we can see how that kind of works. The one that you may be most familiar with is Ohm's law, right? Ohm's law is about how the flow of electrons, our current, uh, the thing that's pushing those electrons through a circuit is a delta V, uh, the, a difference in voltage, um, which drives those electrons. And the thing that keeps them from flowing too fast is the resistance. Uh, so if I have a large voltage and a small resistance, I'll get a large flow. Uh, if I have a small driving force uh, and a large resistance, I'll get a small flow. We see a very similar equation in what's called Fick's Law, which you may not have run into uh, unless you've taken some chemistry classes, uh, which describes how concentrations of mass change over time. So if I have uh, some salt water that's next to some fresh water, Fick's Law tells us how that salt moves from uh, the salt water into that fresh water. Uh, and so the driving force here is a difference in concentration. If I have a really salty water next to uh, fresh water, it's gonna, there's gonna be a larger driving force here. And our, uh, our resistance is defined by some of the physical situation, right? How far apart uh, the two concentrations are, how much contact they have with each other, and then a diffusion coefficient that describes some of the molecular uh, interactions between, in this case, salt and fresh water and um, uh, some of the things that are particular to that uh, physical situation. And finally, we could look at Poiseuille's law, which you've seen uh, in your fluids class, which in which describes the flow of uh, a liquid through a pipe uh, with laminar flow. Uh, the driving force here is pressure, and the resistance has to do again with the length of the pipe, uh, with the cross-sectional area of the pipe, and the viscosity of that uh, of that liquid. And so, all three of these fit this format of flow being equal to a driving force divided by something that's resisting that force. Why does that matter to us? Well, it matters to us because heat transfer rate equations fit that same format. So when we look at the conduction rate equation here, uh, we can rewrite that rate equation in flow terms where our resistance has to do with the distance between the two temperatures uh, the area of contact between those uh, two materials or two temperatures uh, and our conductivity coefficient K. Okay, for convection, we can do the same thing in terms of turning that into a flow equation. Our convection rate equation becomes Q over delta T divided by R driving force divided by resistance. But here our R is defined by our convective conditions, uh, how much area of contact uh, between our fluid and our surface and our convection coefficient. What's the advantage of restating these or reparameterizing these equations as a flow equation? Well, it helps us see a parallel to Ohm's law uh, and this is going to allow us to solve more complex one-dimensional problems because we can start to think of um, physical heat uh, situations as resistance networks in the same way we would with the circuit. And here this you know, <laughs> the little yellow guy tells us we can 
you know, flow describes all sorts of uh, different equations. This is a really useful conceptual way of an imagining a physical situation, uh, including uh, how many M&Ms uh, this little guy is going to eat. All right, so let's put this into practice. Uh, imagine a plain wall is made of three different materials here. Uh, we can't you just use a rate equation here because our K is going to be different in each of these situations. And we want to know what our heat rate is through those walls. Okay. By observation, we can recognize that the change in temperature from T1 to T4, that is the T surface 4 and T surface 1, is going to be the sum of the delta T's in each of the three materials. Okay, that's we're just adding up our temperature changes to find the total temperature change. Then we can use our flow version of Fourier's law of the conduction equation to find an expression for each of these delta T's. Okay, so all this is here is a rewriting of our conduction rate equation in which we isolate our delta T. And then we can recognize that, oh, these guys here, that is our resistance R in the flow format. Okay, so L makes, you know, is going to increase our resistance, contact area is going to decrease it, a high conductivity coefficient is also going to decrease that resistance. So we've rewritten this guy as in terms of Q, the amount of flow, and R. Okay. Now we're going to take this form and put it into this equation. And we get this here, where our total temperature difference is going to be our Q, so we're kind of pulling Q. We know Q has to be the same through all of these, right? Because if we're at steady state, we're going to reach whatever goes into any surface here has to come out that other surface. Our flow has to be steady all the way through. So we pull Q out um, and we end up with this equation here where we've defined R uh, when we reparameterized that conduction rate equation. And now we can see very clearly as we rewrite this guy here, this becomes delta T surface. Um, we can see that parallel to the series equation uh, in circuits. Okay, so this is our um, resistance. Our, our, uh, if we put resistors in a series, this is the equation we get with Ohm's law, and this is what we get uh, with our heat transfer equations. This is a nice way to think about what's happening here, right? We can sort of look at these and imagine, okay, the thing that's going to cause this heat flow to be slower is if one of these terms is really big, right? So the thing that's going to matter most is, because we're summing these up, uh, is whichever one of these resistance values is largest. And so just knowing that is helpful in terms of kind of understanding the physics of this situation. Um, if I, you know, if we imagine this is an insulative wall, if I have one layer that's really good at insulating, it may not matter very much what my other layers are uh, because I'm just going to be adding those and it's going to be dominated by that, um, that, that um, really big resistive layer. Now, uh, you have to remember what assumptions go into this resistance network before you use this sort of uh, network thinking. You have to remember we don't have any heat generation here, right? There's no, in a circuit, there's no parallel to having a, uh, some kind of heat generation. Um, this is only about 1D heat conductions. We're, we're, the metaphor is this is like a wire, right? And so all of that flow is headed in one direction. Uh, and that it has to be at steady state. Okay, so we're not talking here about what's going to happen if we change T1 or T4. We're thinking about over a long period of time um, what 
what's going to be the heat flow through these surfaces. Um, and if none of the, if one of those assumptions is not true, we can't use this network type thinking. So let's expand the way that this is useful, right? So here's our basic equation where Q is going to be equal to the driving force divided by our resistance. Um, we can apply that. We applied it to a series type network before. We can also apply it to a parallel uh, type situation, right? If we want to say, um, you know, imagine what the heat flow through a wall is that maybe has studs uh, with insulation between the studs. Um, that's like a parallel network, right? That heat flow can go in different ways through that wall, just like in a circuit. And we also have a whole set of ways to think about this in terms of convection uh, and of flow through uh, cylinder. And so we're just to kind of look here, we've got a, the basic heat rate definition. Um, here's a heat rate as we're going through a plane wall. This equation comes from um, a basic mathematical uh, analysis of a cylindrical wall where we have um, a radius one surface and a radius two surface. So you might think of this as a, like a wire with insulation where the radius one would be the outside of the wire, radius two would be the outside of the insulation. Uh, and we would want to know how much heat is flowing from, say, that wire, which might be generating um, some uh, electrical heat, right, um, some resistive heat. Uh, how does that move through our insulation? And then we have a convective surface um, that we talked a little bit about before, um, where our heat rate is defined by the convective rate equation. Each of those gives us, you know, you can see each of them has a delta T in it. The part that's not delta T, the inverse of that is our resistance. Okay, and so we just, each one of these, we're just flipping this part of the equation to give us the resistance to that flow. One last little trick with this is like with an electrical circuit, uh, we can have a bad connection uh, between materials, um, say in conduction, okay? And so uh, a rough interface, like if this is our interface here, uh, is actually going to impede conductance because air is really resistant um, to, um, to conductive um, heat exchange. And, uh, and so this essentially is like adding another resistor, okay? And so we can decide here that there's an R contact uh, and we can add that in our series, right? So if we have, you know, material A and B, the flow through here might be, you know, have to do with RA and RB, but also with R contact. And we'd sum all three of those uh, to get our, uh, our series resistance, our total resistance. Now that increases the complexity of the problem because oftentimes we'd have to define R contact. You see that R contact here is defined by Q. Usually we want to find Q uh, and so we'll have to have some way to define R contact, usually by experience, right? If we have some idea of um, how two materials fit together, what kind of glue we're using, what kind of pressure is on them, uh, we would be able to define by experience what that R contact is. All right, that's resistance networks for heat transfer.